Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Library and I'm really thrilled to be here for our end of Pride Month celebration with our, um, our local authors Federico Arribia, Anna Burke, Jane C. Esther, and Bren Bataclan. We're going to be talking all about their books and writing for the LGBT community in just a minute. Please use the chat to let us know where you're coming from and if you have anything you'd like to say to our authors while I do a quick introduction. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Library for supporting all of our programming. We couldn't do it without them. I also would like to thank a multitude of libraries who have gotten together to bring this um, program to our communities. That includes Lincoln, Needham, Medway, Peabody, Danvers, Somerville, Dedham, Winchester, Sutton, Beverly, Canton, Weston, Belmont, Wayland, Lowell, and Newton. And I, I just think that when libraries get together, we can you know, create magic, and as we have with this program tonight. So um, thank you all for being here. Thank the, I thank the authors for being here. And um, I would like to just say that if you, if you have chat, feel free to chat in the chat, uh, chatter in the chat. If you have questions though, please put them in the Q&A so that I have an easier time of finding them. Uh, we are recording this session and we are also live streaming it on Facebook. Technology is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so without further ado, I just wanna say that I'm really happy, like I said, to have Bren Bataclan here, a, a Boston-based artist who wrote his first book last year. Anna Burke, who lives also lives in um, Massachusetts with her wife and many houseplants, I've heard. <laughs> uh, Federico Arribia, who's a retired physician and an active member of all the S S uh, squibbies and nesquibbies and all that stuff. It's so amazing how many resources there are for authors in this area. And Jane C. Esther, who's the author of The Universe Between Us and The Uninvited and the Convergence. And um, she's actually the one that helped me put this together, so I'm really um, thankful to her. Sarah Jean Horowitz, unfortunately, couldn't be with us tonight, but we and we'll miss her. But we will also we will also be thinking of her as we um, formulate our answers to the, lots of good questions. So, first of all, I'm just going to um, throw it to the authors and say, tell us a little bit more about yourselves because I kind of did a quick introduction and maybe something about your more most recent book. And I'm going to start with Anna. Alphabetical. Well, I'm Anna. I write queer fiction across a variety of genres, some contemporary romance, some speculative fiction, science fiction. Um, I like retellings. We were just talking about Cersei before this started. And I see, um, let's see, my most recent book was um, the sequel to my first book. So that would be Seawolf. And I am working on a genre mashup of a uh, gothic partial epistolary i'm not even really sure dark academia um romantic horror novel oh yeah. kind of getting all covering all your bases i see yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah you know so i'm going to keep going in alphabetical order with bren hi i'm bren Bannockland and i'm a boston cambridge based artist i'm from california um i see someone from long beach um, I just painted a mural there. So I moved here to teach at UMass Amherst, but I'm now painting full time. And um, this is my first book about my mom called Faye. Um, and um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> well, thank you, Brent, for being here. And uh, we'll be talking more about Faye in just a little bit. Uh, Federico. I am Federico Arribia. I am in Malden, Massachusetts. Um, Last year, I self-published a couple of picture books, and next spring, La Vin Querido is publishing my debut novel. Um, it's a coming-of-age story about a couple of Mexican-American uh, gay Latino boys. It follows them from, a, from childhood through adulthood. Okay. Jane. Awesome. Uh Jane Siester, that's my pen name, so if you see me in real life, um, I have a different name. Uh, I live up in Woburn, and um, my pronouns are they, them. I, um, I mostly write sort of definitely queer, adult, romancy, sort of sci-fi, spec fic kind of stuff. Um, my latest was a duology, because um, you know I want to be cooler than doing a trilogy. 
Uh, so I did a duology and um, that I'm, I'm really um, proud of that one. And my new work is uh, sort of happening slowly over the pandemic. Um, and I'm working on um, a YA uh, novel as well. And also you might notice I have a weird thing on my lip. Um, a cat attacked me. So, but it's just, if you're like, why, why do they have a weird thing on their lip? Just so you know, no. I thought it was a cool tattoo. So I'm. Um... Wow. Thank you. <laughs> sure. I was getting like Queen Amidala Star Wars vibes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's super cool. Okay, so I'm going to start off with some questions that I have. And then, like I said, to anybody who's here, feel free to put questions in the Q&A and I'll take them as we as they come. So um, I, I'm going to start with Bren on this question. I'd like to know from all of you um, how you are growing up or your um, formative years really um, in, inform your writing. OK. Um, well, I'm going to start kind of work backwards, <laughs> if that's OK. So I um, married for 26 years, and Bob just retired from teaching 35 years. So. <laughs> I'm with someone who reads nonstop. So he reads like hundreds of books a year. So he has helped me become a better reader and writer. I'm also part of a Filipino American book club and we've been meeting for the past 15 years. So I'm, I hang out with a lot of Filipino American artists. So um, they really, uh, like when, when, when we started in 2007, I had no dreams or aspirations of being published. And so because I hang out with a lot of Filipino American authors, they um, inspired me to write. So um, as a kid, I've always wanted to be an artist. So that was my form of expression was visual art. So um, I did have a little poetry kind of kick um, when I first moved here to teach at UMass Amherst. And that was 25, 20, oh my gosh, that was 27 years ago. So this is why I'm working backwards because um, I had no plans to write um, until um, recently because of who I married and who I hang out with. So that's me. Mm -hmm. uh, Federico? Well, in, in terms of my formative years, um, I would say my novel is basically uh, based on my relationship with my brother, my younger brother. Um, and we were poor in Ohio in the 1960s. Um, and I remember the very first book I got, um, I had joined a book club without my parents knowing. So it arrived in the mail. And, um, you know, I recount this in, in the, my novel, but, you know, I was very, very excited that I was allowed to keep it. Um, that might give you a little bit of a sense of, of the kind of a home situation that we were in. And ever since then, I have been uh, just in love with, with reading. Um, but uh, I found out very early that I did not see myself in anything that I read. Um, it wasn't until I read um, Front Runner when I was, um, God, I was in high school that I first read about uh, a, a gay character. Um, and then it, years later when I read um, The House on, on Mango Street, where I read about, um, you know, a Chicano family that, you know, I started realizing I really want to see myself in books. I just love the experience of seeing just a little bit of myself in these books and these characters. And that's what's really kind of driven me to kind of, as you, as you mentioned before, I'm a retired doctor and I've been bouncing around with lots of different uh, other um, professions. So I landed on writing a couple of years ago, and that's this is kind of my focus. And I want to write um, books that haven't really touched on, on topics that, um, that I think need to be out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jane? Um, yeah, so I, I was uh, always a huge, huge fan of um, my library and like being in my library and um, which is also why in my professional life I became a librarian. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I, I was always around books. I loved like Nancy Drew, like strong, like women characters, um, things like that. But uh, just like Federico, I mean, I think, at, you know, during my childhood in the nineties, like there was a little bit more uh, a representation, but like 
not really anything like we have now, which is still not enough. Mm -hmm. um, but um, when I was about 16, I wrote a story and I, it was like a library contest and the winner got a CD and I like really wanted a CD. This was when CDs were just coming out. And um, I think there were only two people who entered and I, I was the winner of those two people and I got my first CD. So that was like my sort of like, I guess the beginning of my writing career where I got like something for my writing. <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, like a lot of, uh, especially in uh, my, my latest two books, Uninvited and Convergence, part of that takes place uh, where I grew up, which is um, upstate New York, Finger Lakes region kind of. And um I, you know, you kind of just, you have like these ties to a certain place and you just kind of, uh, when you write about it, it just, you know, it's like, it becomes like another character. Um, so I was really happy to sort of write about that and sort of explore it a little bit. Um, and I don't know if other people have like weird feelings about where they grew up, but it does, it, it sort of helped me kind of feel a little bit prouder of where I grew up. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my story. Mm -hmm. Anna? Also grew up in the Finger Lakes region. Um, don't write about it. <laughs> uh, so, well, I come from a long line of teachers. My mother is an English teacher, so that I, you know, off the bat, I was on you know, that particular path. And as a kid, I had a really bad stutter, so it was very hard for me to express myself verbally. And when I, when I wrote though, you know, my, that was my way of essentially letting people know I wasn't, you know, a total idiot, which is of course, the minute anyone doesn't communicate the way that people consider normal is what happens to you. So that, I think that sparked it. And then as everyone else has, has mentioned, you know, I, I didn't see, there just weren't enough gay, gay characters. So that was a natural transition from my very early Ursula K. Le Guin, Cat Wayne's fan fiction, um, which is the first story I remember writing. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you all wanted to write what you wanted to see in books for the most part. Um, so Federico, I'm gonna start with you on this question about um, who's your intended, uh, intended audience for your books and what do you want to get across to, to them? Um, my intended audience is hopefully everyone. Um, I want to write the type of books where either, you know, there's the whole mirrors and windows um, kind of uh, explanation about how books can, can be experienced. And I want to write the type of book where um, kids who have not, or generally I write for kids, um, who had not previously seen themselves in a book are seeing themselves. And I'm hoping that kids who are not seeing themselves are feeling empathetic, are feeling interested in learning about uh, some a uh, person who is unlike them. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that everyone, I, I hope everyone is my audience. Mm -hmm. Jane? Um, so, the publisher that I write for uh, at this at this point in time is exclusively does I guess I, ninety nine percent um, like uh, lesbian related fiction, um, especially like romance, but also other kinds of things. So that sort of ends up being the audience that uh, sort of reads my stuff. Um, but I definitely, uh, especially for my first book. Um, I, I really wanted it to speak to people who um, kind of see the, it's sort of like a, a utopian kind of vision of the future, um, even though there's climate crisis, um, you know, two people can still fall in love and be happy. So I kind of wanted to like write a book that people were like, okay, that's like, you know, there's not... It, this is a this is a future and it's not like perfect just like our future is not going to be um, but there is still like kind of hope out there um, and I think that I, I hope the same thing kind of came through with my second um, and third book but um, yeah you know uh, random people sometimes pick it up and um, write to me and that's like really cool uh, people who wouldn't I wouldn't 
normally see um, when I when I do events and things like that. Uh, so yeah, hopefully everyone, but in reality, you know, just with the publishing world, you get people who you, who it's marketed to. Mm -hmm. Anna? I would say a fairly similar response to Jane in that, you know, my publisher is predominantly queer. And when I'm writing, you know, that's definitely the audience that I have in mind. But, you know, having said that, I, I read all kinds of things and most of the I, and I don't know. Yeah, I've done some, some people who I've had to check my my own preconceived notions about who my readers might be. And it's led to some really interesting conversations and, and, and some wonderful friendships, too, you know, just so optimistically, I'd like to say everyone. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> and Bren. Um, my publisher, Pawa, specializes in Filipino American literature. So I guess the number one kind of my, my uh, target audience is the Philippine American community, but, but my book also deals with my coming out process and my mom being really accepting. So, um, so it's for the queer community, but it also deals with my mom's uh, mental health issues. So that's one aspect of my book and also the art part because it is a graphic um, memoir, it is a graphic novel. So, all for, but just like what Fred, Fred, what like Frederica said, I hope it's also for everyone because um, it's about a mother. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I want to go off. I know I sent. Uh, I want to like dig into a little bit about this um, audience that we were just talking about, who are you writing for? Because it's a little bit of a misnomer, I think that, you know, when I was thinking about the title of this is writing for the LGBT community, because you're not, it doesn't sound like you're writing for the LGBT community, you're writing to write, and you're writing for people to read. And, um, and the part of it about being a queer writer or writing for the LGBT community is for people to see themselves in your books where they're not seeing themselves elsewhere. Is that kind of a synopsis of what you all were saying? Well, that's that's what I'm saying, definitely. Um, you know, others have always uh, have already said this, and I would say that most people would say, um, I have been reading about white people, straight people, and uh, fully able people all my life but I'm not any of those. So, um, you know, if I can uh, experience, you know, those, those people and their cultures and their lives, I think what I'm writing is not really, you don't really need to come to the reading experience with anything other than just an open mind. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, I don't write anything offensive. So, uh, I just I just think that anyone should be able to read my book and and come away with um, a, a sense of of understanding and and hopefully enjoyment. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. Jane, I saw you unmuted yourself, and I've completely lost track of who's got, who I'm calling on. So feel free to speak up. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, um, I so I would say. For me, um, I actually wrote my first book sort of with the uh, publisher that I've now published for in mind. Like I really wanted them to publish my book. Um, so it does, I don't know what Federico means by like offensive, but my book does have, that book has seven sex scenes. So it's definitely for like a specific audience. I'm definitely, I, sex is not offensive. No. <laughs> to some people, it totally is. Um, <laughs> well, for, for, for what I was saying. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's awesome. So, I mean, it definitely, you know, like it, it, I had that in mind and then I sort of was like, oh, okay. Like I feel pigeonholed. I don't, I want to actually write for like a really, a much broader audience um, than that. I think there's totally value in, um, in knowing your audience and writing for them and people, love it when you keep you know 
writing books with them in mind that really feel like, you know, experiences like that they want to have or like fantasies or whatever. Um, so I think it's sort of both. So somebody in the chat did say, thank you for your service, Jane. <laughs> I think it's those sex scenes that we're talking about. Um, <laughs> uh, Anna, Brand, you want to comment at all about that? No, I can keep, I can keep going. Okay, so um, again, I, I'm gonna dig a little bit into this whole thing because uh, Federico, you said something really interesting is that all of your life you read books that were not about yourself. And I, I guess I wonder how are you using your, your writing, and I'm gonna start with Jane on this, to, um, to write for the queer community, but be inclusive of that straight, abled person. Are you? Do you care? No. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> if they want to read it, fine. Um, honestly, if they don't, whatever. I mean, I'm sure that there are straight people in my books. Maybe, maybe, like one or two. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they can read a different book. Anna? Yeah, I think that is the beauty of, you know, just the vast amount of fiction and, you know, all, all kinds of media that we have, right? You know, in, in theory, in theory, everyone can see themselves and everyone can, you know, have their own type of story they want to read. And of course, that's not the reality. But when I am writing, I'm definitely writing for, you know, my queer audience. And I wouldn't even say that's necessarily an intentional choice. I mean, just, I'm, I'm, no, it's, I guess it, it is an intentional choice. Obviously, we are presented with these options, right? You know, you, if you want to, I'm, I'm rambling. I just lost my train of thought. Did I mention I'm a writer and not a public speaker? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you for your service. <laughs> Brad? Well, for me, for the past almost 20 years, I've mostly been working with schools on mural projects. So, um, you know, being queer, I, I talk about my personal life, but it's not what I normally think. Even though my last mural in Worcester is all about diversity. So there are some gay couples that I painted, the um, rainbow flag. So that was really wonderful. So this is my first kind of project where um, I highlighted my sexuality and my relationship with my husband for the past 26 years. So I loved it. So this was my lockdown, my pandemic project. So I lost all of my art projects. As I've been telling people when March 13th, was it? Like when that happened, um, I lost all my mural projects and I had two choices. One to be the corner of our house, fetal crying, or find a project and focus on it for X amount of time. And um, no one was telling me what to do. I was on my own. And I talked about my relationship with my mom and being queer, and then it got published. So um, yes, I care at the same time, but um, like in terms of who the audience, but um, as I said, I think it's for everyone, um, queer and non-queer. So that's my book's approach. That was my approach to my book. Yeah, I really loved in your book how um, your mom was so accepting. It was just part of part of your life. Yeah. Yeah. I feel very fortunate about that. <laughs> 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 <It was great>. <laughs> <laughs> then Federico. Yeah. So um, uh, all of the stories that I've written have um, at least uh, queer Latinx. Um, and neurodiverse characters uh, in all of my stories. I mean, I, that's that's important to me. Uh, and so I write from basically from my own experiences in, in those types of uh, uh, characters. So I write what I know. Um, and, um, you know, like everyone's saying, you can either decide to read it or not, um, but, um, I like what I write, so I, I think others would as well who are not like me, but um, I'm okay if they don't. Mm -hmm. 
and the, the reason I'm kind of perseverating on this is because I've been ha having, as I've told you a little while ago, that I've had other panels with other, you know, like authors of all different bands and straits and, you know, whatever. And um, so they're saying that a lot of the authors are saying, well, oh, now I'm starting to pull in the diverse characters into my stories. I'm, you know, bringing in somebody who's gay. I'm bringing in somebody who's neurodiverse. I'm bringing in, and it's it's like a conscious choice on their part Whereas for me, like listening to you, I'm just thinking this is your life and you're kind of, as you said, Federica, writing what you know and what is the, the your surroundings, I guess. So it's not part of like you pulling something in. And that's why I was asking, would you write straight characters? Because are you, um, you know, are you trying to make it a full, this is what the, uh, the authors that I've been talking to recently have said is that, are you trying to make it more of a full world? Is that what they're trying to do? Is that what you even care about doing? Like, you know, that's why I'm kind of really perseverating on it because I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. I, well, I would say that um, I am trying, I'm trying in my writing, I'm trying to expand past the G mm -hmm. of LGBTQIA. Mm -hmm. So the graphic novel that I have now um, I have uh, I pretty much every letter, so um, so you know that I am wanting to expand past my own you know, cocoon of of knowledge, but I'm not necessarily wanting to um, to specifically bring in straight characters. Um, they might be there because you know. It happens, or or it probably wouldn't be something where I would just come out and say, you know, that the person is heterosexual or, or straight or whatever. It just would be another character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also think that there's, um, you know, just beyond the LGBTQ uh, community, uh, I think, you know, there's a there's a a a, a giant push for um, own voices. Uh, which is awesome, um, which I'm, I'm white, so I, I'm not that person. Um, but as a queer writer, I am. Uh, but including, you know, people of different races, um, but also making sure to do it in like a really sensitive uh, way that is not in, in any way stereotypical. Um, so I think that probably that's maybe, you know, at least my, my um, thing to kind of bring in more of. Um, I have, you know, definitely written characters of other races and abilities and whatnot. Um, but, you know, more of that is probably called for. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really, um, really interesting too, is that the own voices, um, I'm going to call it a movement, I'm not sure it is, but that you are the most, you're the most able to make this these books as authentic as possible because you've lived the you've walked the walk you've lived the life so um i think it's really amazing that you're doing this talk with me tonight because i'm learning so much and i'm seeing in the chat that people are saying you know are you things like are you writing for yourself and then for others like is that the first place you go to is like what would you want to read and i think federico i said you i think you had mentioned that earlier too that that's what you um so are you writing for yourself? Is that what Grania asked? And also that the writing a book is a very vulnerable thing to do, which, you know, you put yourself on the page and then you let it out to people who, <laughs> you know, people can be nuts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, you know, I wanted to say to you, Bren, that you almost double do it. And I, in Federico, you just said too, you do a graphic novel. So like you're with the, you know, you have that combination of text and art that hits people in different ways. Have you found that? Has that some of the feedback that you've gotten? Um, I actually wouldn't probably been able to write a novel <laughs> because that's not my strength. And so my best way of communicating is through illustrating or painting. So I found this happy um, kind of I mean, it's just a nice compromise or a nice middle where, um, you know, it's mostly drawings with some text. So, and I love that. And it's really new. I had an exhibit about my immigration experience, the Power Art Center in Boston. And um, I had 17 pieces. And one of my um, author friends said, Brent, this almost looks like a comic book. You should 
create a comic book. This was two years prior to me um, writing and illustrating this book. So that was sort of like the catalyst of how that happened. I, I like I had no idea. I mean, like I like couldn't even imagine at that point having a comic book um, written. That I'm, you know, so I'm glad I was asked to like do that challenge because here it is. Um, so Federico, we have a question for you. Do you write, uh, do you incorporate disabled characters as an own voices writer as well? Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of my own personal story, um, I am dyslexic, I have ADHD, and I also have a stutter, um, which was pretty bad when I was a, ch a child and I have hopefully uh, shown that I have um, been able to control it. Um, much better in, in my later years. So um, when I write my characters with those um, conditions, then yes, I am speaking, I am writing from my own, my own voice and my own experience. Mm -hmm. And Anna, you had said earlier too that you had a stutter when you were younger. Um, does that play into your stories as well? That doesn't so much. I, I also, I have some chronic health problems. So, so that's been something I've been exploring more and, and that's been something that's been more vulnerable D just for me, you know, just sort of coming to terms with what that means for me through my characters. Um, you know, Therapy is expensive, right? So we <laughs> do what we can, but I, I've been wanting to write a character with stutter for a while and, and I just haven't um, for the, I don't, I don't even know why. Um, no, I do because we all have our own internal biases as well. And so, you know, it, it has taken, like I, that there are, there's a part of me that just like, doesn't, doesn't want to remember what that was like. And so I, I, I haven't gone back to explore that. Whereas the, you know, chronic pain, chronic health concerns are, are something that, you know, I very, oh, see, there, there's a stutter. It, it showed up, made an appearance just for you all. Um, you know, it's just, that seems to be, well, it's not going anywhere, right? So I, and with the internet, it has come to my awareness that I am, you know, far from alone, right? And so many of us these days are, have chronic health problems. Um, and yeah, I, I, I guess at a certain point, I decided that maybe I should just bite that bullet and try writing about that. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'll be brave and explore the stutter, but yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> probably but not. I think that uh, just from the last half hour, I feel like you're, like I'm hearing you say, like that people aren't silos, you know, you, just because you are queer, you you write for the queer community. There's so much more to you than just that aspect of it that you put on paper. And so your stories can be really full full fledged because you are full fledged. Does that make sense, Jane? I mean, I suppose there are parts of us that are like little tiny baby birds. Sorry, <laughs> that's okay, Jane. Uh, I mean, I. I'm gonna go with the baby birds. So <laughs> I don't really have anything to add beyond that. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> but um, I think that that's important for people to see that um, even though we're, I'm a reader that wants to read a, a, a book that is written by a queer author or an own voices author, that there's so much more to you and there's so much more to me than the person that wants to read a queer book. Um, so I'm gonna ask you, I think Federico said this earlier, is that getting beyond the LGBTQ, what's the next thing? Because I had a, um, an LGBTQ panel earlier in the month and I learned something about, there was ACE and arrows and things like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. Because like now that people are, felt like more comfortable with the LGBT, maybe, that now we can explore more. Does that make sense? Does that come up in your books? Um, I'm gonna start with, um, with uh, Jane. Um, yeah, my book that I'm working on now, the YA 
book, uh, one of my characters is um, asexual. Um, and uh, I think non-binary at, at the start, and I think they might um, discover that they're trans. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think there, there are like other definitely sort of these um, newer sort of identities that haven't really been like talked about before. Um, I still think uh, transness and uh, gender stuff is still something that is not really written about a ton. Um, so I think both of those things, yeah, definitely um, places to sort of explore more. Mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah, I would definitely echo, it's especially with all of the, of the legislation that they've been passing, that we need so much more trans representation and my heart just I, I so I, I also teach and my heart breaks for my students I, I teach at Emerson College and it's an art school they're all queer right you know <laughs> not to make gross stereotypes but it is partially true and I you know I, I, I just I hear them I hear their stories as an educator you know I, I guess where I come from is I'm really excited for them to tear to, to tell their stories. And you know, I have had some incredibly talented students who I know are going to go on to publish these like beautiful works. But I also think that there are so many ways to be any identity and there's still so much room to explore within those two. So for for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I guess I want to see me and my community and me and my good friends represented and, you know, being queer, you know, that that does typically fall under, you know, the, the entire umbrella, right, when you like to stick together. Um, but I don't know, you know, there's, there's, there are, so, the joy of writing is that we get to just experience being these different people as our characters, so. I know. Yeah. Bren, I know. Uh, and, and if you don't have an answer for this question, somebody did ask if you're going to be writing another book. Yeah. So I will try to answer it within this okay. context. But I first would like to say, Anna Federico, I also studied. So, oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. That <laughs> was a big part of my. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, wow. Three. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, Bob my husband he was just on the news about a week ago so he um the first one to start an lgbtq after school um, um club or organization so every day um for the past 10 years i you know like it's gone beyond the lgbt uh, lg lg yeah and so so i've been immersed with the youth and um all this what's been going on um my next book, if I have given the um, opportunity, which I've been sort of working on, it's, uh, it's about me being a new waver in the 80s in San Francisco and how <laughs> that type of music, um, Mina, you know this, right? <laughs> Mina, no. Um, I was part of her 80s um, trivia and um, I won. <laughs> <laughs> yes. By a landslide. <laughs> so, um, so like my next book, if it happens, will be in the eighties. So I wish the um, there was there would be more. I'm like I did have one friend, but um, if I guess if it takes place now, that would be more of a, a part of it. But it's in the eighties in San Francisco, so it's mostly just LG. So mm. I'm just being honest because it'll be about my youth in the 80s. Trying to be authentic. So I'm with Federico, I'm going to go back to you with that, the original question about um, trying to expand our knowledge about, um, about the different aspects of people. Right. Um, so in my graphic novel, um, I, it's called The Realms of Chochi Pili. Chochi Pili was the um, Aztec god of homosexuality and mm. male prostitutes. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, bit of information that most people don't know that, that these gods existed in the Aztec and Mayan culture. Um, and so the, uh, 
the premise of the of the graphic novel is that it's it's occurring simultaneously in modern Mexico and in Mesoamerica, Mexico in the 1500s. Um, and so uh, because I'm putting Mesoamerica in the realms of Xochipilli, um, I am able to introduce characters who are pretty much, you know, every every letter of, of our of our collective experience. Um, and because it's a graphic novel, um, I can introduce characters in a way that um, I don't need to have someone come right out and say, um, I'm non-binary. The, the, the words and the facial expressions hopefully say it. Um, and so I am definitely trying to incorporate more um, of, the, of the letters that oftentimes are not um, represented in our literature. Thank you. So um, one of the questions we have from Rachel is um, for Anna or anyone who wants to answer, and I think this is one that everybody can answer. I'm going to read the whole question, but then I'm, I'm going to ask a particular part of it. As a gay horror writer, I often struggle to include diversity that doesn't feel like I'm re-traumatizing my own communities. And I worry, even if I'm being real, that I just shouldn't hurt these characters, even though I'm writing graphic horror. As you are now writing a graphic horror, gothic horror book, do you ever feel this way? How would you suggest working with dark material and including queer communities? And it's a question I think we can all, I, I would like to hear from all of you about in terms of how do you keep from traumatizing your own community by not using stereotypes or not using you know, those silos that we, that people have been put in, not necessarily that they belong in. And Anna, I'm going to start with you since this was directed to you at the beginning. Let me just hop on my soapbox. Um, <laughs> well, first I would love to see, and I'm going to say this out loud, and obviously I apologize ahead of time. I would love for us to get to a, a place as a community where we are happy to bury our gaze again, right? And by that, what I mean is the bury your gay trope for, for anyone who, who isn't familiar is you know just um and we can start with horror right you know when you watch a typical horror flick um you can pretty much tell who's gonna die based in order of their their race or their sexuality or their level of overall sluttiness if they're a woman i think um so so that i think the, the first answer is to not fall obviously deeply into stereotypes but but also we we need more of all kinds of stories. And if you are a reader who is looking for horror and you want queer horror, that does a little bit of its own gatekeeping um, to a certain extent. It's, it's, I'm not gonna pick up a horror novel expecting happy things to happen to all of the characters. Having said that, I think that, you know, one of the things that a horror does is it allows us as writers and as readers to explore. Oh no, Anna, you just froze. Uh, I'm gonna go on to Bryn and we'll okay. come back to Anna. All right, so, um... I'm grateful, like I can't deny it. As a kid in the 80s, um, there's a lot more queer representation. So um, I'm really happy about that. And also um, in terms of seeing Filipino Americans um, in the media, um, you know, I'm seeing more and more like the um, Grammys. This this year had five half Filipinos, Filipinos. So it's great. I mean, so in terms of being seen as heard, um, in like gay related um, literature or media, um, I sometimes don't see who I am or see or heard. I, so that's why um, it was really important in my book to highlight my relationship with Bob because I don't really, like I don't see a lot of us like me and Bob and like in the media, like we're kind of boring. We've just been married for the past 26 years. And um, so I feel like that's important to show, like, it's like, like, especially for, um, like folks who are just coming out, like the young, younger gay guys that, 
it is possible to like be with one person for 26 years and like be really happy. And um, so that is my activism, it's the personal side, which I think a lot of gay male related um, shows, like I just don't see us a lot. So it's important for me to um, show that in my work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anna, did you want to finish your thought? Um, yeah, I don't know what happened. I just fell off the Zoom call. Um, yeah, just to summarize, um, horror is a way of exploring, you know, these really dark aspects of human nature and something that I was struggling with in, in, in this novel that I've been working on is I wanted to explore consent and I didn't want to traumatize my reader as part of that exploration. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fine balance, but I think that the worst thing that we can do is decide that it's too difficult. And so we're just not going to try. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I don't have like a perfect answer necessarily, except that that's why you have hopefully it's, it's good to have friends who like to read your work because they can say well that was deeply disturbing Anna maybe you shouldn't ever write about that ever again or they can say things like um what if you what if you switch the narrative and, and framed it in a different way that you know gave some I don't know power dynamics and power balance I think is where the heart of the answer to this question lies and when you figure it out please let me know. <laughs> um, Federico, maybe you, maybe you and Jane can help us figure it out. <laughs> well, I, I would say that um, the, the story, the, the question doesn't just relate to horror um, because I am grappling with whether or not my uh, novel will need to have a disclaimer um, because of the trauma that, uh, that my story will likely trigger um, for people who have experienced um, domestic violence, um, priest sexual abuse, mm. um, and also uh, people dying uh, of AIDS. I don't shy away from some of the graphicness. Uh, you know, I'm a doctor, so I dealt, I had a lot of patients, uh, especially in the late 80s, early 90s, who were, were dying, you know, lots and lots and lots of people dying all the time. Um, and I don't shy away from that because my brother died of AIDS. And, you know, the book is about um, these two characters. And, you know, one of them is based on my brother. So, um, so it doesn't just have, have to be horror where uh, people can be traumatized by what's happening to um, the LGBTQIA characters. But um, I'm writing... Um, honestly, and I'm hopefully writing um, in a way to, you know, I'm not being sensational about, about anything that I'm, I'm doing or saying. Uh, it's really meant to be an honest portrayal of people in everyday life dealing with some of these issues that, you know, were imposed on us. Mm -hmm. Jane? Yeah, I mean, I think if you, if you make sure that you're writing like full whole characters with backstories and not like I don't know like stereotyping people I like it, it depends on sort of where where the issue the um sort of you know bad parts are coming from like people in all communities are shitty um and deserve to be written about. I don't know if they deserve to be written about, but it, you know, you can write about them. <laughs> you can include yeah. that in your book. Um, that's fine. Um, I'll share a personal uh, story. I, in, in my um, portal series, um, Uninvited and Convergence, uh, one of the characters, um, it's sort of like a second chance uh, romance uh, uh, storyline a little bit. And one of the characters is like deeply biphobic. Um, because of an experience she had with this person. Um, and she does like kind of grow <laughs> in within the story to where she's like, oh, like I'm being, I'm being a terrible person. Like um, it's not, a, it's not a big storyline. That's like kind of like a tiny little thread, but, um, but somebody, uh, you know, read that and they 
left a review that said like that's biphobic I don't want to read this crap so like you're gonna you're you know whatever it is like if your characters are growing like you might trigger somebody unfortunately um but just kind of you know you can't make everybody happy mm -hmm. um so you know write what you want to write I would say mm -hmm. um so I want to go back to a question or comment that Grania had that I think is really relevant to this com this part of the conversation of do you think that um, there's too much expectation put on you to represent the community and you held to a different standard than, um, you know, I'm gonna say the JP where James Patterson, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. But you know, like the, the sort of mainstream, I'll say, authors, um, are you held to a different standard to, to not traumatize, to not, to be more sensitive, to represent everybody in the LGBT community, even if it goes all the way to the AIDS and the, you know, whatever it is. So is is it is it a lot? And I think I'm gonna start with Bren with this one. Um wow, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm an unexpected author. You no know, one was really waiting for me to write anything, which I guess in a lot of ways it was very liberating. Because again, this like I, it it just happened. So I didn't feel any pressure whatsoever. I thought it was really up to me how much I wanted to share, and it was a really great experience. And what's awesome about this too is even though I'm out, um, and I said I pri primarily primarily work with elementary school kids. I mean, with elementary schools, I travel. Um, across the country, but still mostly Massachusetts. So unlike my husband who taught at high school for 35 years, you know, he comes out like once a year um, to like his students, but he's totally out. For me, um, it was a challenge coming out pretty much every week, and especially when I'm in states that is not as liberal as Massachusetts. Um, so having a book about my mom and coming out, it's been great because it's just one click away that schools can, you know, like discover my book. And again, just another click to find that, oh, he's a gay man. So one thing I love about this book is that um, most of the time when I um, en enter a new school, I think most folks know that I'm gay. And so now I feel more confident that they know me, you know, as whole versus back then I have to come out. So um, it was really scary at first, because as I said, this is a big de departure from my mostly kid friendly related where I'm like I'm not saying that my book is not kid friendly though I don't recommend it for really young kids um so um like again there hasn't been any pressure except for myself how much I was going to be out because it's a totally different audience but it's been great overall so I am more out because of my book and again it wasn't intentional but I'm so grateful for it mm -hmm. better we go I, I'm sorry, I, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like there's more pressure on you as a, as a queer writer to represent? Right. Um, so it, I think it depends um, a little bit on uh, your agent and or your editor or publishing house. Um, I don't have an agent. Um, I haven't really been trying to get an agent. Um, I. I think, well, I'll just leave it. I think it's just, I, I like being able to deal with, with an editor directly. And um, this particular editor um, at Lincoln Querido is, um, is wonderful. I mean, he, he wants me to write what I write. He does not really expect me to um, fill in blanks or to get me to do more than, um, than what I'm offering him. So I think, it, it, it could vary from person to person. I, I would not want to be in a relationship of any sort with an agent or an editor where they are wanting me to fill in blanks and um, do check marks. Mm -hmm. Jane? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't feel like any particular pressure to represent. I kind of just write what I want to write and um, Hopefully, I mean, I think this 
this next book that I am writing, uh, I will probably have to get an agent and Federico, I don't look forward to the experience. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, sort of depending on who like ends up with it. Um, I, 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 I kind of just, you know, do what I want. And, and you, my publisher both strokes books, I just kind of hand it to them and they're like, cool. Uh, that's sort of around what you write usually. So great. Um, I don't, yeah, so. Okay, Anna? I actually really like this question. Um, and the reason is that I'm a Twitter lurker. I don't, I'm not really particularly active, but I, I, I do occasionally log on and then I log off with just my eyes bleeding. But <laughs> this isn't something that I've had to deal with too much personally, but I've definitely seen targeted at larger name queer authors, which is this idea of, you know, purity politics. And as a community, we're so starved for role models even with the role models that we have now, I mean, it's still, it's just not, not enough. And I, it's especially an issue, I would say in YA and middle grade, you know, because adults in theory, right? Our, our brains are fully formed-ish and we're able to distinguish between the author's intent and, you know, a, a character's intent. But I, I, I think some readers do turn to fiction, you know, looking for, role models, whether that's how to be a, a certain type of way or in a relationship. And I, you know, that idea is horrifying to me because yeah, I, how am I supposed to be like, like I am messy, I'm a messy person. I don't know what I'm doing half the time, right? And, and, and so, and I, I, I write messy characters, but I also absolutely get where the readers are coming from. You know, they, especially if you don't have, you know, a lot of LGBTQ people in your life and you are like actively searching, you know, okay, how do I have a healthy relationship? How do I have a healthy relationship with my friends, with my parents, with my partner, right? And we get a lot of information about that from the media. And, and so, you know, I'm thinking of my first like mainstream queer media experience with the L word. And if I had based any of my relationships off of that, I would, well, we don't need to go down that road, right? Um, <laughs> but so, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a good, it's a really interesting question because it touches on quite a few different issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Brent said, it's a big question. Um, so I'm um, just take one more question from our attendees. This is from Jules and it kind of goes into something again, Federico said about, um, Jules says that just finished a draft of a book that they think is, has potential and they'd love any advice on finding an editor, building a good relationship with editors, getting published. Um, so I am gonna start with Federico on this and then we'll just go around and then I'll have one last question. Um, so I guess I'm gonna assume that, that Jules does not have a, um, an agent Right. Uh, because otherwise the agent would find um, the, the editor. So finding an editor um, it can be tough. You, there are only, um, well, from my experience, there are only a handful of editors that open up uh, to unagented queries. Um, and um, I basically, I'm in the Kidlet community, so it may be different uh, for adult um, authors, but uh, there are really just uh, a handful of editors who will, who will take it. Um, I would suggest getting involved in SCBWI um, or other, um, other conferences, because when you go to conferences, you, you have the opportunity to query editors um, by as virtue of your, of your admittance to the conference. Um, and that is how um, I found my editor. Although Levin Querido does accept unagented uh, queries. So I, I didn't have to wait for that particular conference to, to query him. Um, but you know, you just kind of have to figure out which editors will accept you um, a, a query without an agent. Mm -hmm. Jane? Um, yeah, so my uh, my my publisher and um, I think also Anna's probably um, accept unagented uh, submissions. Um, so that is potentially a way forward. I think that if anybody who is writing, and I, I think um, somebody, Stacy 
put this in the chat. Um, I would really think about, you know, is if you're, if you're going to be writing a lot of books and you have like, you want that to be kind of a thing that you're spending a lot of time on um, and you are able to self-publish knowing that it's like really, really hard to do the marketing and stuff like that. Um, I don't have time or willpower to do all that stuff. Um, however, I know that, you know, some people are like super happy um, uh, writing for like a publisher and some people are like extremely happy uh, being self-published. Um, so those are two ways to do it. And then the other way, of course, is to kind of uh, see, you know, get an agency if, you know, if it's something that you think uh, like a big five publisher or, or uh, even a smaller uh, sort of niche publisher would be interested in, that is also um, a way to go. Mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah, I, I, to reiterate, I mean, it, the, the first thing to decide is, all right, you know, what path do I want to go down, right? And talk, talk to authors as you're doing right now, right? To, to hear what they like. So for instance, I wanted to go with a smaller press because I didn't really see that many queer books being published by the big five. So I was like, well, I want to go with the press where I know that I'm going to be able to write these stories. Um, but I also, yeah, joining con you know, conferences, literary societies. I mean, I'm a little bit of an introvert, so that was daunting to me, but just as any field, right? It's knowing people can be helpful and talking to people and meeting other writers will help you, if nothing else, you know, learn about what you want and what you want out of it and who is good to work with. And, you know, if, if you choose the self-publishing path, uh, that has a, a lot of freedom in the sense that you will get, you'll get to choose the editor who you want to work with. You'll, you'll get to choose, you know, all the various cover artists. Now you better be organized uh, <laughs> because otherwise it will be a disaster. But yeah, the, the benefit of an agent is that there is someone who's going to walk you through the process. And that is very appealing if you are somewhat disorganized. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've learned so much about you today, Anna. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's you great. That's sure. exactly what I wanted. <laughs> Brad, how about you? Was your how was your path to publishing? Okay, so um, I don't have an agent, but I do have a graphic design background. So after I had a rough version of my graphic um, novel, um, I just had to print it. I printed about fifty of them, just mock. And like again, I didn't expect to be public yet published. So I just did this my own way. I just sent them to 50 or 60 publishing firms and I got rejected. You know, almost all of them, the Filipino American community um, saved me. So Pawa gave it a chance. Um, and so that's how it happened. So at, for like two to three months, I just got rejection, email, letters. It was heartbreaking because again, I was unemployed. This was my baby. And, but I didn't lose hope. I just kept telling myself, you don't have a choice. You're going to make this happen. And I did. And I think um, my approach was unconventional because again, I, I didn't expect to like have a book and it happened. So keep on trying, you never know. So I got my book published and it's on its third printing. You know, it's a tiny press, but um, so I'm really happy. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, most authors say if you want to write, right you know like don't sit around waiting for you know the right weather or the right you know something just right and then and for publishing it sounds like just keep going just keep trying you know so um my last question really is just self-promotion <laughs> tell us where we can find your books even put it in the chat so um i can send out um some links afterwards jane i'm going to start with you where can we find your books Oh yes, and I was also answering Stacy's question. Show us uh, your books. Um, <laughs> that's one yes, of them. The other two are up books. there. Um, you can find my books at um, boldstrokesbooks.com, um, Amazon, some book like big booksellers, um, P Town, <laughs> some places. Um, yeah, online, and I'm also at some prides usually. Um, I make the pride circuit. So unfortunately no Boston pride this year, but uh, 
I will probably be at Hartford Pride. Okay. Um, Anna, where can we find your books? Yeah, uh, same as Jane. Um, some Barnes and Nobles, quite a few independent bookstores. Basically, what I tell people is to go to your local bookstore and ask them to order it for you if they don't have it. And then, then you are supporting me, right? Which is great. But also, more importantly, you are helping to keep some brick and mortar bookstores still there. But also, you know, I'm, I'm on Amazon and, you know, Google Books and basically anywhere books are sold, you can probably find me. Okay. Bren? Um, I'm proud to say it's being sold at a queer owned bookstore. Um, all she wrote books. Um, over at the Assembly Square. It's also available at um, the Harvard Coop and the Harvard Bookstore. There's a Filipina-owned bookstore in Long Beach, California, I'm saying because someone there is Long Beach. So Bel Canto Books. Um, also, I just shared femmemoir.com. That's the um, website of my book. And someone asked to show our book. So this is my book. And that's my mother. And so it's called Faye at Comatized Sons Graphic Memoir. Thank you. Federico? Uh, so um, if you follow me on Twitter, or, or uh, I just put in the chat, uh, fjebooks.com is my website. Um, my two picture books about a squirrel that I, um, that was injured and I took in and gave him physical therapy. And uh, it's a true story. Um, and so I wrote a couple picture books about that. Um, you can get that at Amazon. I would say uh, a way to help authors in general, and we are at a librarian, uh, our library um, thing is to always ask your library to order these books. That is a great way to get our books out into the public. Um, I have a limited budget for everything. Um, so I know a lot of people can't buy books, can't buy all the books that they'd like to. But if you get them into a library, it doesn't cost you anything, and you can read the book that way. Um, my next book isn't, uh, isn't coming out until next spring. So um, hopefully, um, if you follow me on Twitter or um, I guess in my website, you can also, I think I have a newsletter or something like that. Um, if that happens, I will send you information that way as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I do want to make a plug for libraries because I know there's some librarians here and we partnered with a lot. But if you do request any book from a library, they're very likely to get it. And the author does get paid for that, you know, that it goes to the publisher. So like it's it's a way of supporting the authors um, and your community. So, you know, it's not like you're hurting them by taking it out from the library. So anyways, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, I have just learned so much, and I think people have really enjoyed it, and um, I, I, I really appreciate your time and your thoughtfulness around the questions that we all had. So, um, you know, in the chat, feel free to say thank you and, and how much you love this talk. And again, I want to thank the many libraries that partnered with us, as well as the Friends of the Ashland Library for supporting this program. Federico, Jane, Bren, Anna, you've been amazing. Thank you again so much for being here with us tonight. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night.